Yeah. Uh, Hello, everybody, dear dear guests. Uh, uh, nice to have you here. Uh, I've pleasure to to welcome you here on behalf of the Heinrich Böll Foundation. My name is Robert Sperfeld. I'm working here in the uh, division for uh, East and uh, Southeast Europe. Um, I. Uh, I should say a few words about the background of uh, Heinrich Böll Foundation's activities and how, how it comes that we are invited uh, you today for this uh, event, you and our speakers, of course. Um, uh, as, yeah, this is not, not a surprise, uh, the, the basic facts. Uh, coal is one of the, the most uh, carbon intensive sources of energy. And, uh, globally, around 40% of CO2 emissions originate in, in coal combustion. Um, but at the latest from the Paris Climate Agreement, there is a global consensus to reduce emissions sharply. And uh, basically, all European countries have ratified the, the Paris Agreement. Um, however, in particular here in Berlin, not far away from the uh, Lausitz uh, or Lusatia coal region in a bit southeast of Berlin. Um, we we know how much the discussions around phase out from coal are difficult. Coal energy is so much linked to regional identity and uh, <clears throat> and, and practiced patterns of doing business and politics. Um, Germany so far itself fails to deliver on CO2 emissions <coughs> reduction, particularly from, from coal energy uh, generation. Um, and as a rep representative of the Heinrich Böll Foundation, I can assure you that here, particularly here at the Heinrich Böll Foundation, we will also, of course, continue to, to push forward the German debate on a transition uh, from coal to, to a sustainable energy mix based on, on renewables. This is uh, a core ambition and a core concern for us as a, a green uh, foundation. Um, but still today, we want to take a closer look into the Western Balkan region. Um, there, in a situation where energy infrastructure is largely outdated and in urgent need of, of modernization, governments and investors uh, facilitate the construction of even new lignite power plants, coal power plants. Uh, these investments uh, lock the countries into new decades of fossil power dependency. This openly contradicts, actually, uh, the spirit not only of the Paris Agreement, but um, also to some degree uh, the, to the, the Treaty on the European Energy Community, um, which in, in its ambition to harmonize the, the region with EU energy markets, the member countries of the energy community uh, have obliged themselves to comply with a broad range of EU standards on energy efficiency, market integration of renewable energies and emissions from industry and energy uh, em generation. Um, I'm glad to learn more to tonight about the background of all uh, these uh, developments in, in the Western Balkan region. Um, and I'm happy that uh, we have three highly competent speakers from the region uh, who agreed to come and to speak today here to us um, and to share with us uh, uh, their insights. Welcome to all of you. Um, and for the facilitation of our discussion, I want to hand over to my colleague Jörg Haas, head of the division uh, for international politics here at our Heinrich Böll Foundation head office, um, who is in his work currently focusing very much on uh, global trends on infrastructure and investment uh, politics, which also falls, of course, into 
uh, well into this discussion. Yeah, so I wish all of us an interesting discussion. And I will hand over to Jörg, uh, who will also introduce to you the, the speakers briefly. Thank you, Robert. Um, thank you for the nice introduction. And yes, I'm very glad to have you here on this sunny late afternoon uh, in, in Berlin, or sunny evening. Uh, great that you made it uh, here into the Heinrich Böll Foundation for I, what I very much hope will be an interesting, even exciting conversation about the prospects of coal and the prospects of actually a different energy pathway for the Western Balkans region. I have here on my panel uh, three very distinguished guests, uh, and I'll briefly present them in the order that they will also later on speak. Uh, the first is Pippa Gallup. She is research coordinator for CEE Bankwatch Network. Um, she is she's specialized in coal and hydropower in the Western Balkans, and um, I think you live in Croatia, if I... If, if I'm correct, see Bankwatch for those in the environmental movement, they know this is an, an, an organization which has a long trajectory of, you know, actually monitoring uh, activities of uh, multilateral development banks uh, in Central and Eastern Europe. It is really a pleasure to have you here. It's, <laughs> it's one of the most renowned organizations which I most admire, I must say, in the environmental movement. Uh, the second person on the panel is Denis Zizko uh, from the Center for Ecology and Energy in Tuzla, so in, in Bosnia-Herzegovina. So he is uh, here to really present us a perspective from the region, also from a city that uh, has coal and that is burning coal, that actually new coal projects are currently planned. And the third on the panel is Dirk Buschle. He's deputy director of the Energy Community Secretariat in Vienna. And uh, Dirk is uh, a specialist on energy law. Um, uh, he is also visiting professor at several Europe European universities. And the energy community, we will learn, has an important role to play in this discussion. So without further ado, I would just uh, give the floor first to each of you for a couple of minutes to present uh, your perspectives. Uh, Pipa, you should give us an introduction to the overall, uh, say, situation in the region. Thank you very much. Um, so at the moment, the situation is we are talking about six countries here, which are commonly known nowadays as the Western Balkans, Albania, Bosnia, Kosovo, Macedonia, Montenegro and Serbia. And uh, the current situation in the region with electricity is that it's very largely dependent on a mixture of coal and hydropower. Uh, most of the countries have, have a kind of mix, whereas Albania is completely hydropower dependent and Kosovo is almost completely coal dependent. Um, and all of the generation infrastructure, almost all, is, is pretty outdated. Um, First, the, the excuse was the war, the war, the war, but actually a lot of time has passed since then and the governments are still kind of talking about what they're going to build more than they are actually building. But they generally plan to continue in the same vein as, as before. This is kind of driven by a combination of kind of doing what you already know, um, but also interests of specific groups behind the plans. Um, at the moment, uh, there is 8.3 gigawatts of coal power in the region. Uh, this is all lignite. Um, and so there's a lot of also open cast mines, uh, a lot of people employed in the coal mines. And um, in fact, kind of too many people employed in the coal mines in terms of productivity. The productivity is pretty low in most of the countries by, by European standards. And um, so there is a kind of momentum to continue with this industry um, kind of as if it's possible to do infinitely. And um, since there has been not much investment in, in recent 
years, there is, although many of the plants are more than 40 years old, there is uh, not any kind of a talk of coal phase out yet. This is really different from the situation in the EU. There is also not a sufficient surplus of electricity that you could just close the coal plants and nothing would happen. I mean, this is simply not possible at this stage. Um, so definitely some investment is needed in the energy sector, but it's the question, which kind? At the moment, uh, we are aware of nine coal plants in the region which are being actively pursued. That means in all of the countries except Albania. Um, one in Serbia, five in Bosnia, one in Montenegro, one in Kosovo, and one in Macedonia. And uh, in fact, there is a lot more ideas for coal plants. Even nine is not enough but, uh, for, for the proponents. But these are the ones which someone is kind of working on moving forward at the moment. And I think it's important to bear in mind here that we are talking about a region which totals around 18 million people. So this is actually a huge number of plants. I mean, for German standards, it maybe sounds like nothing. <laughs> but if you look at the population, it's, it's a huge number of plants out of any proportion to, to what is needed or what would make any sense. And, um, and unfortunately, in the whole region, there is a serious lack of planning associated with these plants. Most of the plans have been around for decades, and they just get transferred from government to government to government to government without any kind of review. And they kind of slowly, slowly move forward, sometimes stopping, sometimes speeding up, sometimes stopping, and sometimes speeding up again. So it's quite hard to actually measure what is, what is planned, but the, it's, it's around nine plants. The, obviously, I, I guess many people are here familiar with the, the problems around coal per se. Uh, Dennis will speak more concretely about the problems in Tuzla, so I won't, go, I won't go really into that. But I think it's important to say that as well as the kind of general problems with coal related to health and climate, there are specific issues with each of these projects. Um, it was mentioned in the introduction that all of these countries are signatories to the Energy Community Treaty, which brings with it certain obligations to, uh, to adhere to some of the EU environmental legislation. They are also all countries which are working towards joining the EU, some sooner, some later. But the, tr the direction of travel is towards the EU, and all of these countries see their future in the EU. For that reason, and for the fact that coal plants will last for about 40 years, it's pretty logical that if they really do insist on going ahead with coal plants, that they should be at least in line with the legal obligations. I mean, we are completely against the construction of new plants, let's be clear. But the minimum legal requirements are, are not even being fulfilled at the moment. Uh, for example, um, <laughs> Last year in the EU, the new standards came, the new pollution control standards came into, uh, into play called the LCP breath, which are considerably tighter than the standards in all of the countries at the moment. And yet none of the, none of the plant promoters are designing the plants to be in compliance with these standards, even though Going forward, as the countries join the EU or as the energy community adds new <coughs> legislation to the treaty, at some point they will have to comply. So this is purely short-sighted sighted thinking and just trying to avoid making the projects more expensive. Uh, also, we have very limited access to economic information about the projects, but from what we know, almost none of them are taking the CO2 costs into account. Uh, at the moment, the countries are not part of the ETS, and so they don't have to pay, and so they think they will never have to pay. And, uh, and even some of the feasibility studies 
show that in case an ETS price is applied, even a very low one, it shows that the plants <coughs> wouldn't be viable. But the governments are just acting as if this doesn't exist and it's not going to happen to them. Uh, other issues that we've encountered have been around the tender processes. Um, since the, the European public banks have mostly decided to stop financing coal plants, now the main player in terms of financing is China, and the main companies which are interested in building the plants are Chinese companies. And what we've seen in some of the cases is, for example, with this Kostolats plant in Serbia, there was simply no tender process. The, there was just an agreement made with a Chinese company, and then the, there was an agreement made between the Serbian government and the Chinese government to free the, from, from the obligation of, of conducting a tender process, and hey presto, we have our company without any kind of competitive procedure whatsoever. And uh, the other issue we've noticed a lot is, is subsidies. Um, the countries are obliged to follow most of the EU state aid rules, but we see that there is very little political will to do so. And there are a lot of subsidies like providing the land for plants to be built on, providing state guarantees under very favorable conditions for the companies and so on. So there are a, a lot of putting aside even the, the usual issues associated with coal, there are a lot of, um, a lot of specific problems with the, the plants. Um, so the situation is, is obviously quite serious. Um, it, the governments in the region are very hard to influence. There is a lot of corruption, weak courts and so on. Um, however, I think it's important also to underline that because we are talking about small economies, we are also talking about southern countries. So there is a lot of potential for renewable energy, especially the solar energy is really untapped. And so I think for me it's particularly frustrating to see relatively small countries with the relatively high renewable energy potential not taking advantage of that. And I think this is the country's real chance to, to turn around and take advantage of their renewable energy potential. Also with the caveat that also this has to be done sustainably. Um, as uh, Jörg mentioned, I work also on hydropower plants in the region and uh, this is an issue for us that in, in being critical of coal, the governments tend to think of hydro as the only other option, whereas the region is actually a biodiversity hotspot and there has been a real outbreak of very small hydropower plants on every stream and the whole region basically in the last few years. So I mean at the same time as criticizing coal we have to be sure that the renewable options are also going to be done sustainably and there is really no alternative but to strengthen the rule of law, the environmental key and so on to make sure that all the and the, of course especially the energy planning so there is a lot of work ahead of us, but for sure these uh, countries have the potential to move very quickly from, from coal-based economies to, to renewables and to more efficient economies. This was something I didn't mention, that al also a lot of energy is wasted. In the distribution system, in the usage, uh, some of the countries use a lot of electricity for, for heating. There are enormous opportunities to take relatively simple measures to actually reduce the energy usage and to, to ramp up the renewables usage rather quickly. It's, it's a question of political will. And why, just to, just to conclude, I think it's important to say, you know, why are we coming to talk in Berlin about this question? Uh, we see that things are slowly moving in the EU 
in a better direction. The legislation, the targets is slowly moving in a good direction. And we really need the help of European countries and the European Commission to support through the energy community or through whichever processes they find appropriate to support the region to stop the development of coal and turn around towards energy efficiency and renewables much quicker than it is now. Because if those new plants get <laughs> built, it's, it's too late. We've, we've locked in the, the money, we've locked in the carbon, we have really restricted our space for movement in the future. So there is potential, but we really need a lot of backup and political assistance now from the EU countries as well. Thank you, uh, Pippa. And uh, Dennis, while you're going to uh, the desk, I, I think the lock-in is not only uh, threatening physically with new power plants, but also politically. I mean, if I imagine a couple of countries exceeding the EU with a cold mindset, a, a coal mindset, a coal constituency, a political economy of coal, this will further strengthen the kind of coal block within the EU, which will also um, you know, affect the speed how the EU will be politically moving ahead with the energy transition on the EU level. But now, Dennis, over to you. I'm really keen to hear your view from Tuzla. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, it's always difficult to talk after Pippa because she usually says everything, so there is nothing left for us. <laughs> but I'll try to, try to give you, well, a short overview of what's actually happening in Tuzla with the air pollution and other pollutions actually caused by, by the old industry we have in the region, and especially the uh, thermal plant in Tuzla. So this is basically how Tuzla looks during the winter months. And this is the one where Tuzla is somewhere down there in the smog with the uh, dust and everything coming out of the electricity plant. Yeah, so this is the electricity plant we are talking about. So this is Tuzla electricity plant, which I'll, I'll give you the details about that later on. Fairly old Russian technology. I mean, the first block was built somewhere in the late 50s. So uh, some of them are still working. So you can see that we have problems even if it's not winter. So basically, uh, the, the worst one you see is the one which is in the opt-out thing, which is supposed to work another 20,000 hours. And this is what it costs. So uh, that's block four, basically, which, well, I mean, you can see with the chimneys, this is block four, and it has basically almost no filters. And this is what happens when they start the fire in the, in the well, they try to start the, 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 the actual boiler. And since it's very old and it was not done, well, the maintenance is, well, in none of these, the maintenance is done properly, they quite often go offline and then they have to spend thousands of uh, liters of diesel or, or heavy oil or whatever to start the boiler and this is what happens. I mean, that dark on the, on the right, that's block six, that's the, the newest one. You see the dark, uh, 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 what's the, the thing? Yeah, smog or whatever. That's actually diesel. They're starting the, the boiler. So not to blame just the electricity plant. Yeah, we have the problem with household heating because again, they're using uh, coal. And that's something which, well, is a result of living in an area with coal mines. Back in the 70s, when we had the opportunity of gas line entering actually into Bosnia, the local coal lobby uh, prevented gas actually to come to Tuzla because the initial plan was for the gas to come through Tuzla, then go down to Sarajevo, the capital of Bosnia. But then they said, no, 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 we don't want gas because it will jeopardize the jobs of the coal miners. So we are facing this constant story about jeopardizing the jobs of the coal miners since, well, <coughs> since 50 years. 
Okay, these are some of the facts about the coal mines and, and the TPP. So in a, annually we, well, the coal mines in Federation produce roughly 7 million tons of coal, out of which some 80, 85% is ba it actually burned in two coal plants we have. Uh, the problem with that coal is that it is, uh, it's lignite plus we have brown coal, which is lignite with higher caloric value, but with a higher percentage of sulfur in it. So it emits huge amounts of sulfur dioxide. So annually, Tuzla TPP emits between 50 and 70,000 tons of sulfur dioxide. And there is no desulfurization equipment in none of the co uh, electricity plants in, in Bosnia. So the official data from for 2016 is uh, Tuzla TPP emitted 5,800 and something tons of NOx. 66,000 tons of SO2, 1,000 tons of uh, PM or solid particles, and almost 4 million tons of CO2. So that's one year. And yeah. Anyway, so uh, as I said, there are, well, people said that the lifespan of, of, uh, of electricity plants is 40 years of a block. This is not really true in Bosnia because the one that is still operating, the Block 3, is built back in 66, so it's quite old. And the youngest one is actually from 78, so now this year it's celebrating 40 years. And they plan to keep it online another 15 or even more years. So, as I said, no desulfurization equipment. Uh, there are some plans now with this National Emissions Reduction Plan, but that's something we'll talk maybe later about because um, the plan is good, but in a way it is used by our authorities to prolong the installment of this equipment because they have a deadline in the NERP. But anyway, we'll talk about that later. Okay, uh, talking about health problems. Back in 2013, we have done our first analysis of the actual impacts of air pollution. This is mostly air pollution emitted in Tuzla. And there on the right side, you have some statistics basically about the last years of life, which is 4,000 and something years of life and all the other statistics. I mean, the, this study is available on, on, online and you can download it or whatever. So, uh, and if you calculate that in, into money, which people like to do, it came up to some 99 million euros a year. That's how much the actual health uh, impacts cost our society on an annual basis. That's just from Tuzla power plant. Uh, after that, uh, we had reaction of the local, unfortunately, just from the local population living around in the vicinity of the electricity plant. So we had some 50 people basically coming to demonstrations. And at that time we were actually the authorities, the local media, and everyone else actually uh, accused us being foreign spies and uh, jeopardizing the economy of the country and all all the all the stuff that goes with 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 this. And yeah, it was not really a, a huge reaction from the population, but at least these are the people that actually live with this electricity plant for for their whole life, basically and they're fully aware of the fact, and they saw this study and as, as a sign, yeah, maybe something will move. Unfortunately, uh, it took us another five years, but we'll come to that later, to actually gather a wider support of the population for this. And for that, we use the statistic data uh, about the air pollution, and, and we have actually pushed through the media and through some other studies and uh, 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 to raise the awareness of the problem. So here you, you'll see some graphs with the statistics of first sulfur dioxide. So here you have 
from 2010 to 2017, we have a, a system of, of measuring stations in Tuzla. There are five of them in Tuzla region, which more or less accurately measure, measure the situation. And in, within our legislation, we have more or less uh, uh, um, transponded the directive for air quality. So there are some bylaws which are defining the, the limits where for, for example, SO2, the annual limit is 50 micrograms per cubic meter. And you can see that most of the time we are above that line. You have the peaks during the winter, which is more or less logical, but you have also cases during the summer where we are above that uh, 50 micrograms limit, which gives you an indication because, why am I telling that? Uh, the authorities, the electricity plant, and, and people which do not want to accept the fact that coal is bad, constantly claim that it's not the electricity plant which is causing the air pollution. They're constantly blaming transport and household heating. This proves that it's not household heating because we have peaks of sulfur dioxide during the summer and no one is heating during the summer. The peaks are higher during the winter because of the temperature inversions where you have all the pollution blocked in a valley. We have the unfortunate, well, it's, it's yeah. Unfortunately, most of the towns in Bosnia are basically in valleys surrounded, three sides surrounded by hills, and then you have just one side out. And in the case of Tuzla, the only open space is actually blocked by the electricity plant. So we have hills around and then the electricity plant blocking everything. So, okay, the next one is, uh, this is December 2015. Then again, uh, in the legislation, we have uh, the daily limits uh, defined for sulfur dioxide at 125 micrograms per cubic meter. And in the legislation, it says that this limit can be breached three times in one year. As you can see, only in December 2015, we had 25 times this limit breached. Absolutely no reaction from the inspections, absolutely no reactions from the authorities, and nothing basically happened. The same thing we have in 2016, now it's 26 times. Uh, okay, this is the overview for the hourly limits, which is 350 micrograms. And the figures you see, I mean, they range from 143 times up to 700 and something. And the allowed number is 25 times a year. Again, I mean, I, mean, I don't have to explain. <laughs> uh, now we are going to PM 2.5. Uh, annual limit, 25 micrograms. You see the graph. Average daily, we are basically constantly above 25. That's December, that's January. Uh, and this is, yeah. This is for all the five, five stations. Uh, and here you have, well, basically this, this slide is interesting because of one fact. It gives also an indication how often actually the measuring stations work properly because in order to have a, a, a valid uh, a measure, it has to collect, it has to work under certain conditions, how many hours a day and da da da, to have a, a valid, valid measure. So during 2015, one of the stations had 195 valid days out of 365, and the other one only 30. Same thing in 2016. And the point here is that most of these stations do not work. Uh, and they usually break down because of uh, during the days when the pollution is the highest, because the filters and, 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 well, the equipment cannot function after a certain level of pollution. It just stops and then someone has to go and clean it and change it or whatever. So these figures do not represent the reality of the situation. They're much, much worse. 
because the equipment simply does not work. And it's very difficult to actually maintain that equipment in Bosnia because a very complicated procedure of uh, procurement, uh, public procurement or whatever. So it takes few months for one piece of equipment to be repaired or replaced or, or, or put back into function. Okay, so coming back to the demonstrations and everything, uh, these are the two studies which we have produced in the meantime. The, well, both of them are basically focused on the worst area in, in Tuzla, which is actually uh, around the electricity plant, where we had the first group of people protesting. And the reason, uh, well, I, I'll just go there. I don't know if they can hear me. So basically, here you have the electricity plant. Here you have the air disposal site. And this is Tuzla. This is the actual town. Yeah. OK, so as I said, electricity plant, ash disposal sites, and Tuzla town. So. Basically, we have the plant and all the ash disposed in, in the urban area of the town. Because that's the cheapest way to do it, you know. Uh, so on the left side, you'll see the actual, some of the results from the first study where we actually analyzed samples of soil, water, human hair, some food, uh, I don't know, sediment, where you'll see that there is a huge, huge presence of arsenic, cadmium, chrome, nickel, lead, and even mercury. All the, all the data is in, in the study, so you can find them. And after that study, we actually used that info and done the second study, which was published this spring, basically in February. And uh, unfortunately, I don't have the translation for that. Hopefully, I'll find money to translate it. <laughs> uh, where we actually went out on the field in these mostly, mostly affected areas with a questionnaire prepared by a health expert, uh, with uh, collecting some statistical data about the present diseases which we could actually link to the source of, uh, of uh, pollution, basically, or the heavy metals which are found in the previous study. And the results have shown that in most of the places we have checked, the diseases and the deaths caused by this by cancer, usually, could be linked in these present percentages presented at the end. So 41% of the death cases and, and the diseases in, in for example, Divkovici are, could be uh, 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 related, directly related to the pollution caused by the ash disposal site, by the heavy metals present there. Okay, so after five years, these are the demonstrations in February 2018. So it's not anymore just 50 people, we had a few thousand people. And we also have a Facebook group, which is now the popular thing, I hear, uh, where we have some more than 30,000 followers, which are, and now we are in a situation where we are not anymore accused to be enemies of the state and attacking the jobs and everything. Now we are in a situation where the actual general population is openly discussing the question of pollution and the causes of pollution, and openly stating, yes, we have a problem in this electricity plant, someone has to do something. And I was just asked by someone, well, well, uh, what's happening with the mayor of Tuzla? Because basically, well, the mayor of Tuzla is, well, we, we are a coal town. We were built based on coal and salt. Finally, this year, uh, on one of the meetings of the council, an official request was sent to Electroprivreda, to the company, its state of company. Official request was sent to them to actually do something with this authorization equipment, to finally find money and install 
the desulfurization equipment. So finally, even the authorities, the local authorities are uh, putting the finger on the electricity plant. Okay, and uh, maybe you don't know, but in Tuzla we have, we are also famous because we have salt lakes. We have salt mines and we, in the center of town, we have salt lakes and we are very proud of it. But this is another lake, which is one of the ash disposal sites, which looks really nice on, on the picture. It's one of the two I've shown you up there. And this is how it actually, can you sort it? Looks. So Tuzla, Tuzla is back there, I mean, just with, behind. So the way they transport the ash is mix it with water and then pump it into this huge, well, it's a lake, without any uh, uh, liners, without any protection, without anything. It's just pumped there and then the water drains either underground, you can put the, the next one, either underground or, yeah. So this is how they do it. So that's ash mixed with water. Nothing, they just throw it in. And it enters into the underground water. And there are no tests. No one knows what's happening. And no one, well, inspections do not go out. They're not respecting the environmental permit. And as you can see, everything is lying around. And they claim that that's the, well, there is a statement by the director of, of the uh, electricity plant that they're doing it on, based on the best European standards or whatever. That's how it's done in Europe. So when you go down on the ash, this is what you see, and that's the blue water you see from up there, and you'll see why it's blue. Basically, the pH value of that water is between 11 and 12. I'm not an expert, but that's very, very bad. If you put your hand inside, after one minute, it will become red. I mean, it, it just burns your skin. Uh, you see what's happening with the forests. I mean, it's just, yeah. Well, sometimes even, well, sometimes uh, ducks, when they move south, they see a pond of water land there and they don't leave. They're buried there. I mean, they simply die. Uh, with this water, they also mix some chemicals because they had a problem with recycle. Uh, they had to recycle this water, and they had a problem with calcification. So the pipes sort of shrinked, and they had they add some chemical to prevent that, which reacts with all the heavy metals and everything, uh, and and you have this. I'm not sure if anyone has done analysis on this and, and how toxic this is, but it looks very toxic. And it smells really, well, you cannot feel it, but it really smells. Uh, yeah, so that's the lake two of Tuzla. But don't go there and swim. An extremely healthy environment. <laughs> and when this all dries out, because they are, well, during the summer it dries out, then we have this. So basically it's the dust and everything they've collected in the filters and the ash that came here and it's dried out and it's basically picked up by the wind and it's going around in the houses and in Tuzla, basically, because Tuzla is two kilometers from here. So that's the problem with pollution we have in Tuzla. That's it. Thank you. Thanks, man. You can... Thank you. You have the last light. Last light. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you, Dennis. Uh, that was really impressive. And I must say, I've seen a lot of things, but few 
as yeah impressive and in some way depressing as this and this in the immediate yeah kind of our European neighborhood is really quite shocking. Um, Dirk, you are in an institution who's hopefully going to change this. So we're looking forward to your presentation on the uh, energy community and its potentials. Thanks a lot. And I must say, uh, Dennis, it really takes a lot of courage uh, to come here to this beautiful and clean Energie Salon and present pictures uh, like that. You feel a bit dirty and a bit, a bit uh, from the part of Europe. Uh, that's what they call in German a Schmuddelkind. Um, at the same time, I'm also very grateful um, to Robert, who said at the beginning um, that we are not here and we cannot afford, afford in Germany, and I happen to be German, uh, to finger point to the region because we have a shared past and to some extent a shared present also in between Germany and uh, Southeast Europe in relying heavily on coal. Um, we are not in a position here as Germans uh, to point to these uh, dirty practices um, there in Southeast Europe, and yet we all have a shared and common goal and desire to, to change that. I am maybe a bit more optimistic than the gloomy title of uh, today's session suggests. I do believe, and that's another lesson and another good reason to be here in Germany, that uh, this energy transition uh, that has started or at least uh, has been promoted very much here from Berlin um, has become a global trend um, as is manifested in the Paris Agreement uh, and it is something, it, is a, it started as a small river but it turned into a mainstream to which also the region will not be able to resist. The, um, what we have to do all together is probably how to, to kickstart and then how to manage that transition and that's what I also would like to focus a little bit on. The energy community has been mentioned that uh, the yellow-blue countries are the energy community countries. Um, and um, I have a lot of text on my slides. Um, that's probably also because as a representative from the energy community, I have to take a, a bit of a regulatory um, bird's eyes perspective. Um, starting with the importance uh, of coal, I believe I can be very brief because that is indeed this part of our shared history like uh, Germany, also Yugoslavia, just relied, and that explains, of course, on all the problems that we have to deal with today, relied uh, on what it had, on its natural resources. Uh, unfortunately, not blessed by nature, uh, neither uh, like Albania, the other country there in the Western Balkan 6, uh, which is 100% uh, uh, CO2 free in its electricity mix. That was not the case in uh, Yugoslavia, and also the lignite and the brown coal there is not of the best quality. Uh, so we have to deal with this legacy, just like we have to deal with a similar legacy here in Germany. Um, the way how to deal and how the European Union or Europe in general decided to deal with this legacy, which we know, of course, uh, was made much worse um, than in the 1990s by all the events and the decay and the neg negligence uh, that was uh, given to all these uh, inherited structures. The response was the energy community. Back in 2005, uh, when Europe decided that they would indeed not only take care of this region, which is and will be again a core European region, uh, but will um, bridge the gaps, the existing gaps between our countries here in Western and Central Europe and Southeast Europe through a treaty, the Energy Community Treaty, which with hindsight, maybe unfortunately, but those were uh, the days back in the 2000s, uh, focused very much on market reorganization, on liberalization, on integration of markets. That was the fashion in the EU at the time and uh, almost uh, the single objective also of European energy policy, and that's, uh, of course, it was just consequential um, that the same was done also with respect to the Southeast European countries in order to give them a European perspective, in order to enable them to reintegrate what was destroyed. 
Now, um, as uh, outdated as that may seem against the pictures that we just saw, no, no market liberalization will, of course, help in, in closing a plant uh, like Tuzla. Um, it still matters and it is still very beneficial. I will talk about this a little bit later. Um, in the, already then, in the early 2000s, when the treaty was drafted and ultimately adopted, nobody actually took this series. There were small islands, small, um, maybe ticking time bombs of environmental a key hidden. So a key is European legislation hidden in that treaty, uh, like the Environmental Impact Assessment Directive, like the Large Combustion Plants Directive, all these horrible names from Brussels. Um, which also had a certain lead time, so they only kicked in later, namely today, so in, in 1st January 2018, the Large Combustion Plants Directive finally entered into force, but they proved to be really game changers. This, um, entry in, this entry into force of the Large Combustion Plants Directive, which doesn't exist even in the EU anymore, in the countries of South East, uh, East European uh, of Southeast Europe is a Copernican moment and I believe will really kickstart this energy transition. It's a legal obligation, as such maybe too, not too impressive, but it's also a clear sign that from now on each and every plant um, with certain exemptions, will be checked on their compliance. Uh, and each and every plant which is there in the region, because they're old, uh, because it's almost impossible to retrofit them, um, will not comply with those. So in essence, we should uh, already from 1st January uh, 2018 have closed all these plants. Now the um, Large Combustion Plants Directive and the more modern Industrial Emissions Directive has some inbuilt exemptions as well. This is um, the um, uh, so-called NERPs uh, have already been referred to. The National en uh, Emission Reduction Plans, which is a possibility uh, not to be judged and assessed on a plant-by-plant -plant basis per country, but that you put all of them together in a cloud and then you uh, move gradually towards an overall reduction limit. Um, and also this so-called opt-out, like a wild card, you can say this and that and that plant had to be authorized by the energy community institutions. We will run for 20,000 operational hours more. That looks like very uh, being very generous and I guess uh, against the backdrop of the pictures that we still have in our um, minds, indeed, uh, you would ask why don't you just shut them all down and why is the legislation indeed so generous? But first of all, this is of course something that we have benefited here in Germany as well from. This is European legislation and secondly, um, it only means that if you talk about exemption that you will really have to focus on, on the entire rest and this is what we are um, have to do now, and uh, Tuzla is, of course, among them. So the, if the end uh, of coal-fired power generation in the Balkans hasn't uh, really started or hasn't really come on 1st January 2018, um, we experience here the beginning of the end, and thus probably also the beginning of the transition. Um, that, I believe, is a fact, and that is something that will happen with or without, uh, and with or against the Chinese or anybody else who will invest in coal-fired uh, power generation in the region. The question, of course, and I think this is the really important question that we all have to ask ourselves and we have to contribute uh, finding answer is what do we offer? You cannot just point to legislation and say we switch off uh, Tuzla, we switch off uh, all the other um, coal-fired power plants in the region and then it's it because obviously then the lights go out and much more. So what can we offer um, in replacement? And that is something that I would like to uh, discuss also with you. Um, what, what can come after coal after all? New coal, more coal. We heard that uh, it's, first of all, it's difficult uh, to bring um, the existing, it's almost impossible, also financially impo impossible because no lender will be ready uh, to give money to that, to bring the existing 
uh, plants in line with the thresholds under this large combustion plants directive and IED. Uh, so for them, it's uh, with some delay, but it's game over. Um, we in the energy community very much insist, and we had cases um, there um, where we also cooperated with uh, Pippa and Dennis, um, where we made this very clear that any new plant must fulfill the standards of the Industrial Emissions Directive, so that's European standards. Um, that's clear. If there is coal, then it must be the same um, emission criteria that also would apply here in Germany. Um, this compliance with the law, however, goes beyond. Um, and there, the law is, I am, it has been said, I am a lawyer, and there um, I have to, uh, especially here in Berlin, um, I'm reminded of my legal, legal education and also the books I read, uh, among others, of a certain uh, Niklas Luhmann, who very clearly said that the legal system is about being either illegal or legal, and there is nothing between. Um, and this is something that helps also in tackling issues um, and the problems related to coal-fired power plants. It's not ideology, it's the law. <laughs> and what kind of instruments does the law provide? Well, the Large Combustion Plants Directive obviously is one. Uh, we have this Environmental Impact Assessment Directive. We have an interesting case currently going on against a power or related to a power plant uh, in Republika Srpska of Bosnia, um, Ugljevic, um, which concerns compliance with the uh, um, environmental impact assessment, where, for example, they did not um, assess the greenhouse gas emissions coming from that plant. Now, they thought they, they were, rightly, were right in doing not so, because the emissions trading scheme and greenhouse gas related legislation is not part of the energy community yet. However, through the vehicle, through the back door of this environmental impact assessment, um, you could, and that's what we're doing, reproach the authorities that they didn't take all the consequences into account uh, when they assessed or when they gave the permit for that plant. But maybe the sharpest sort um, is something that is called the state aid law. That's probably a subject not often discussed here in these circles and in relation with the energy transition, etc. Uh, but it turns out that it's very powerful uh, because it means that as a state um, you may not um, support um, or only under very limited conditions and circumstances you may support um, the creation, the building of the construction of new coal-fired power plants. Um, including, for example, through guarantees that the state gives for free to a, a lender, Chinese, German, or wherever they are from, um, including through land for free. Pippa mentioned a, a, cases, a few cases. So, again, it's the law. It's not so much whether you complain about subsidies to coal in general, but it's the question, and that's a very technical question, which we in the energy community perform on a daily basis. Is this particular measure a state aid, a prohibited state aid within the, um, or in the meaning of the European uh, legislation? So that's how concrete, but also maybe boring energy transition can be to look into uh, the, the, the very nitty gritty details and then um, to, uh, of course, take the consequences of this. <clears throat> um, the ETS, I, I mentioned that currently we have no emissions trading scheme. Um, the emission trading scheme is an instrument in the EU which uh, was not one of the sharpest uh, sorts that we had. Now it's been a bit more, uh, made a bit more fit and sharp probably, sharpened. Um, we may get it, we will ulti ultimately get it with EU accession, maybe we'll get it before in the region as well. Um, but it's still um, on, on the horizon, once it is there it's probably also possible um, to give coal a, a real price, uh, but that for the time being requires a lot of not only conviction of national politicians, but also conceptual thinking, whether that's possible after all, especially for energy sectors only. Um, so one alternative for coal is more coal. Um, another alternative is gas. Now gas is also not CO2 free, we know that. It's been 
labeled in recent years a bit as the bridging fuel, uh, which goes together very well with uh, renewables. But of course, if you counsel, if you were to counsel the governments in the region, get out of coal, get into gas, you would also ask them to do heavy investments in infrastructure, uh, in infrastructure which eventually still will be a CO2 infrastructure. Um, that may be something uh, which would be desirable in the short term, but infrastructure happens to be costly and happens to lay around for a couple of decades. So are we really ready to advise them to go into gas now with all the consequences on, on a broad scale? I think this uh, requires a, a more a deeper assessment. Of course, also including um, the geopolitical factors that especially in the region that comes with more dependence. Renewables is the obvious answer. Um, we have uh, talked about hydro already a bit. Hydro is, is the other alternative fuels traditionally also in Western Balkan 6, but uh, recently has very much come under attack. Uh, because if you, you saw all the, the, the ugly pictures from Tuzla, you would, could see beautiful pictures from Albania and the unspoiled and also Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, the pristine rivers there and are we ready uh, to really intervene there and build hydro power stations and dams wherever we can. Big question mark behind that. Wind and solar, indeed, a very big untapped uh, potential, probably more in solar. Unfortunately, there's no potential for offshore wind in the region like there is in Germany. Onshore, yes, uh, but mostly solar. But the problem of wind and solar is, of course, one that we all know very well here in Germany as well. It's intermittency. You cannot rely on that. You cannot just switch from coal to 100% renewables. That would be naive. And you would not take into account legitimate concerns about continuation of life there, of economic life also in the region. Um, and um, I will talk in a, in a minute also about a bit more concrete obstacles that wind and solar exploitation, which needs to happen, which need to increase, um, but which never can fully replace um, the base load that coal has been producing so far but the obstacles that we are facing there. Biomass, maybe, could be an option. Maybe large-scale biomass replace, and uh, currently there's project, uh, projects on their way. There's people who say you can replace all the coal by biomass. Of course, that would have other big and heavy consequences. You would have to go into forestry. Um, the, it can't be an option that we just cut all the beautiful oak uh, woods in, in uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, to replace coal by something else, by something which is considered renewables. Um, but at least it would have the advantage, done in the right manner, that it would provide security of supply, base load that is needed. And all these issues um, I would put at your, uh, for discussion maybe later, uh, in, in one um, recent project, which is the so-called Kosovo ERE power plant, a very controversial one in the uh, place of the same name, Kosovo, um, where they indeed will build a new power plant. The contracts have been signed um, on, based on, on Lignite, where we as energy community have raised very strong concerns as regards to uh, state aid compliance, uh, less to environmental compliance, but the state aid um, issue is, is a pertinent one there. Um, but where we also have to ask ourselves the questions, what are their alternatives? And I think this is something that we can maybe brainstorm later. What do you do in a place uh, like Kosovo, where um, there is little else, there is the, the potential for renewables is not so high. Um, Gas, there is none, so you would have to build new infrastructure. Biomass, there is also none. Uh, so this is, uh, I believe, a good case study, and I'm happy to go into that uh, later, to, um, where we can maybe jointly explore not only what we don't want, but what we actually would want, or what we would realistically also be able to counsel um, to the governments there. Uh, renewables, as I said, is the, the future. There is no doubt about that, and there will have to be and there will be significantly more renewables uh, in the region. And that's the core of this energy transition. Being here in Berlin, um, we we'll, yeah, can ask ourselves the question, because energy transition worked here uh, relatively well uh, in 
Germany away from nuclear to some extent from coal um, and gas towards renewables. Can we just copy that? Well, maybe we could, but who would be able to pay, pay the price for that? This region is not populated by wealthy Germans, not by us. This region is populated by people who cannot afford the price that we are paying here in Germany, uh, the costs for the renewables. And on top of this, um, there is a wishes circle going on which has to do with the costs of capital because the countries are considered so risky, you cannot lend money, uh, you cannot borrow money at a decent price. So you have, you're obliged to um, give high feed-in tariffs which make the price of electricity higher uh, for a population which almost cannot afford the existing one. Um, and uh, we, that's something we have to tackle. This, this uh, problem with the uh, so-called de-risking, with the bringing down of the capital cost is something that urgently needs to be tackled. Uh, probably uh, one of the things that would have the, the greatest impact. Uh, your colleagues Agora here, I don't know where they are, somewhere in the neighborhood developed quite a good, uh, a couple of good ideas on, on this. Um, another thing, another low, relatively low hanging fruit that immediately needs to be reaped is um, move away from these German type, old German type feed in tariffs, uh, Einspeisetarife, uh, to uh, auctions. This is something that we see here in Germany, offshore wind, but also solar. Um, how much you can bring prices down through auctioning, not through giving away support, again, subsidy, state aid, uh, by the state in an intransparent manner, uh, in a way too expensive manner, um, and not only for renewables, but also for coal. This Kosovo Re power plant I mentioned um, guarantees a price of 80 euros per megawatt hour, which is something you will not find anywhere in Europe anymore. Um, we have to move away from that. We have to upgrade the infrastructure, um, in the region and not the big lines. There is no lack of big interconnectors in the Western Balkan 6, as some people seem to believe. We have to look into the small distribution network to make it fit for the challenges of renewables. That's where um, the region is really not fit for taking in um, more renewable energy. We have to integrate the market. Yes, the original idea of the energy community still lives and is still as important as it ever was. One of the answers to the question posed by Kosovo Re is, of course, more market integration. You do not have to build power plants in every country as if they were isolated, as if they were islands. If you um, actually do integrate your markets across border, then you can make huge welfare gains and you can trade with your neighbors. That's important. Um, and something that uh, you know, some of the European thinking uh, that is only slowly hitting uh, the region needs to be implemented much more faster. Capacity markets is something that we developed in places like France and UK, um, where this balance between intermittent renewables and some stable baseload capacity is at least try to be achieved. We still don't have that in the region. We still suffer from this wish of being an exporter at all costs, like Bosnia and Herzegovina, from this wish of having autarky, understandable after the disasters of the 90s, but not uh, something for the future, um, and on this uh, belief in an old-fashioned system uh, with central and big plants that take care of entire big regions or even countries. And about the social aspects, I will not even talk about. Um, we have to find answers for the employment as well, but also for the poverty in the region. That is uh, pretty clear. Um, just by way of conclusion, what I believe will be very important is, is governance in the future. That's a boring word, uh, but it is the stream that will carry away and carry with it also the nations and decision makers and uh, the actors in Southeast Europe. Uh, first of all, we have to, of course, now I'm talking as a lawyer again, uh, stick to the rules. Um, we are, uh, as energy community and incorporating with Dennis and Pippa, for example, we can always only be in the second line of defense. The, the problem is the first line. The national authorities and institutions are too weak 
not by bad intent, uh, but just institutionally. They cannot handle these issues. So they need to be uh, strengthened and that not only, uh, or that does not only go for enforcement of the rules like the Large Combustion Plans Directive, that also goes for measurement, we heard about that, uh, for monitoring, for reporting. All of this needs to happen in the region and they need ours and your support for that. Um, we need, and I'm very happy that we have this really well-functioning dialogue with NGOs. We need not only institutions that defend the public interest in clean air and in health, etc. We need private attorneys of the public interest, civil societies uh, attorneys of the public interest. And they start to be active and to be more active also in the region. That's something very good. We need further integration with the EU, um, not in the idealistic sense, but in the concrete sense. There is a project now on um, coal regions in transition in uh, the European Union that immediately needs to be expanded to the um, to southeastern Europe. There is the so-called clean energy package in the e European Union that immediately needs to be exported also to southeast Europe because it sets the right signal. There is, uh, for example, a some kind of an exchange, a börse uh, in the making, uh, where countries can trade their surplus renewables uh, target uh, achievements. Mm -hmm. uh, currently, uh, recently, Luxembourg bought quota from Estonia and Lithuania. Why not from Montenegro? They have a huge surplus. They could also sell. They need this support. They need to engage in the market as well. We also need to be more serious with planning. These strategies and partly also the so-called NDCs under the Paris Agreement in the region are very often not worth the paper that they are written on. Uh, we need to follow the European mainstream again, go into serious nationally uh, integrated energy and climate pla planning. We need also targets. That's something that we're working on in the energy community 4, 000, uh, for 2030 on renewables, on energy efficiency, but also a cap on greenhouse gas emissions as we have them in the EU. Um, to uh, uh, conclude, we should not, um, as we have done in the past, uh, follow this old logic that we are developing something here in places like Berlin and elsewhere, and then we graciously, with a delay of 10 years or so, export it um, to the um, countries in Southeast Europe as if they were some developing countries. We are here acting and working under the threat and challenge of climate change, and that is a global one that concerns us all together. Um, that is the global unifier as well. And for this, we really need to do, do things together. And I think that's where I see uh, with all this gloomy pictures and all these uh, sad stories um, that we certainly have there in Southeast Europe also of a big chance of moving forward together. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Dirk uh, Puschle. That was uh, really interesting and uh, obviously a broad picture of uh, the challenges. Um, Maybe just a, a brief uh, remark on my side on uh, regarding some of your your uh, remarks. Um, being also a little bit of a, an energy guy, uh, I mean there is um, regarding the costs of renewables. We are fortunately in a situation that is different say, compared to ten years ago, where you know the cost of PV was quite high, but partly due to the the front runner uh, role that Germany has had on the expansion of PV and the creation of markets. Globally, the, the cost of PV have come down dramatically. And actually, in many places, uh, uh, photovoltaic energy is now the cheapest source of energy. I mean, in uh, regions of high insulation in, in India, currently, uh, uh, you know, uh, solar is beating coal. And, um, and so that is, I think, par partly in our problem of, uh, of an immature market. 
uh, the high cost of uh, of PV. It's less a you know a technical issue, or um, an economic issue per se. But the market is simply uh, currently they are not yet developed, and it can really we can see dramatic decreases of uh, of the cost of uh, at least solar also in the Balkans once the market really gets started. That I'm, I'm quite confidential. And on a on a, on a second uh, uh, remark. I think the the concept of baseload actually increasingly, and you will certainly can go into conversations with Agora on that, increasingly kind of dissolves into a concept that we need a complementarity of uh, intermittent resources with balancing power, uh, which is a slightly different concept than baseload balancing power and flexibility, flexible resources in the market. So that's something we will, there is certainly a, a, a perspective going forward that uh, I think all all countries will need to rethink how the energy system functions um, in in a slightly different way. Um, I think we have had three very exciting presentations here on the on the panel, um, and I think instead of going on here on the panel for a long time, I would actually turn already now to uh, to questions from the audience i see a couple of uh, quite um, competent people in the audience and um, maybe we just uh, go directly into into questions from the audience we may collect two or three questions and then go to reactions from um, from here the panel so maybe you is anybody willing to there's one question over there. Yes, working, yes, thank you. My name is uh, Philip Niesen. I'm in charge of international energy politics at BDI, which is the Federation of German Industry. And I would have two questions. The one question is concerning natural gas, which was um, briefly mentioned by you, that was in the past blocked because of the uh, coal resistance. And then you came up with the idea that today there's, of course, also geopolitical um, issues involved there. But could you maybe go a bit more into detail and inform us on where the discussion is currently at? Because the, um, the Russians, they're building a pipeline, the uh, Turk Stream pipeline, which was also supposed to deliver natural gas to the Balkan countries, because otherwise the pipeline would just be too big. Um, so how's the discussion there? And the other part is just um, the image that I get from the presentations before was the Chinese are prepared to come in with cash for coal, and the Russians are prepared to come in with cash for gas. And the European Union more or less comes in with good proposals on governance, which will pay off in 20 years, but it doesn't really convince the people on the ground to make the investments as um, yeah, Mrs. Gallup pointed out, because there's all these laws in, of environmental protection and state aid, but in the end, yeah, it was mentioned by Mrs. Gallup that these projects are still being done because there is no power in the end to exercise these, these, these laws. Somehow it seems to be the case. There seems to be some, some dilemma here between um, legal ambitions and frameworks and the actual power to execute these frameworks. Thank you. Are there more questions? I would rather collect uh, two or three if we have uh, enough questions around. But it doesn't seem to be the case. So maybe we just go to answers and maybe, Dirk, you have been mostly <laughs> the person addressed by the question. Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, the, the, the role of gas um, now... Um, not related to, to its environmental performance, uh, but to the, the, the geopolitics. Um, just to give you an example, and uh, that's uh, Serbia. Uh, Serbia's uh, whole gas sector is uh, completely uh, controlled uh, by one uh, behemoth, uh, by one company, which of course has very close relations uh, with Gazprom, uh, and which also is constructing um, or wants to construct this uh, Turk Stream um, pipeline or the Turk Stream uh, upwards uh, through the Balkans pipeline, which sometimes is referred to as um, New South Stream. Um, so there, with the, uh, together with the, the lock-in effect that you would create um, through building uh, pipelines uh, that, of course, uh, stay there for a long time, uh, the question is really, uh, do you decrease, do you diversify the declared 
policy of uh, Europe, or would you also increase dependence uh, by relying more on, on gas? That's uh, not easy um, to answer, and here infrastructure really matters. Um, if this is done in a, in a way which favors the um, sources which come, come outside our main, from outside our main supplier, uh, then of course you would uh, contribute di to diversification. Um, if not, not. But uh, there is also not a, a single answer. Um, we have had in energy community for a long time, we were actually strongly believing um, in gas as being um, not only a replacement of coal, but also um, something with, which would boost the economic development in, in the region. We followed the concept of a gas ring, uh, which today nobody uh, remembers anymore, which was supposed to circle around the Balkans. Um, a few pieces have been left, uh, and we moved from mega projects like South Stream, etc., um, to smaller interconnectors, which still are very difficult uh, to push through. Um, maybe it it works in some areas. Maybe it's not a, a solution one size fits all. This uh, Kosovo case is one where many, including the World Bank, for example, proposes. Um, and also many Europeans go for gas. Uh, connect this to either Albania, to the TAP pipeline, or even to Serbia. Uh, that's what the Serbs would actually offer. Um, and replace uh, coal by, by gas in, um, in Kosovo. Um, I'm, I'm not saying whether this is a, a good or a bad option, but it's one of the things discussed. Um, the, these pipelines also tell us uh, an interesting story about the second question that you were asking about uh, Chinese investment. While we are coming with good ideas and governance, the Chinese invest and they disregard our rules. Um, there, I, maybe I'm a naive believer in, in the law, but I experienced it, in, in for example, in, in the South Stream project. Uh, South Stream, so a Gazprom project, was uh, financed also by, by third parties. I remember once we had visitors uh, from the um, Development Bank of Japan, uh, which was heavily involved in this uh, financing, apparently, and they asked us the question, a simple question, is this project in a place like Serbia legal or is it illegal? And we said it's illegal. Um, and I'm not saying that this was the reason, but a few days later, Mr. Putin <laughs> called the project off. Um, and I think also, um, uh, also, Chinese investors um, are smart enough uh, to be aware that they cannot afford uh, to build something which uh, turns out to be illegal, either under the current framework or after EU accession. Because um, then, um, I mean, we see it, maybe in the end, the countries have to pay the price. It will not be the investor. That could well be. Uh, but that's why we have to educate and also emancipate them uh, to always check who will pay the price of illegality. In the case of Kosovo, it's for sure the citizens there. They will pay the price for this illegal, I mean illegal, um, a, a coal fire power plant which seems to contravene um, the state aid rules. And I think this is also something where probably also the citizens, uh, not only of Tuzla, but around all these um, places where new Chinese or with whatever investment uh, power plants are being built, uh, it's not only, of course this is extremely serious, not only a health price, it's also um, the bankruptcy probably of an entire generation that can, can come from this. Um, I would ask, yeah, Dennis and, and Pippa to react maybe as well. Um, Dennis. Yeah. I would just have one short comment, and that's something I mentioned on the meeting previously. Uh, the term Chinese in investments is not really true. You mentioned also Chinese investments. Those are, well, the thing that's happening in our country are Chinese loans. It's not an investment. They're giving the loan. Uh, for that loan, we are going to purchase their equipment. It will be built by Chinese workers. And the only thing that we will get is actually paying back that loan. So it's our investment. Because the state is going to guarantee or is planning to guarantee for that loan. 
So the taxpayers of Bosnia will guarantee with their money that loan. So the terminology is wrong. It's not an investment, it's a loan. And it's a very conditioned loan. And the second thing was, I don't know, I forgot. Yeah, well, then anyway, it's not just the coal, but anyway, in, in, in this situation, I'm talking about coal. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would just comment also um, on the Chinese and then on the on the EU and what it offers. Um, um, we've tried to to speak to some of the Chinese institutions in as much as it's possible at all. Uh, certainly, they don't have a culture of civil society engagement, to say the least. And uh, and it's taken my colleague kind of. Many, many hours of painful detective work just to get in contact with anybody at all. Um, and I think um, officially there is the, there is a general political kind of line that they would like everything to be done in line with the EU uh, legislation. and And so there is some kind of this commitment but but this commitment looks quite similar to the Balkan government's uh, commitment to EU legislation they don't really specify EU legislation from which year and in most cases they mean EU legislation from 20 years ago so um, uh, unfortunately it seemed quite positive in the beginning to have this commitment from the Chinese that yes yes we are aware the countries want to join the EU everything must be done in line with EU standards but as the conversations go on, uh, we, we, uh, I mean, we are trying to, to convey to them that EU standards are not static, they are changing, they are tightening, and they need to be in line with this directive and not that directive. Um, but the conversation usually ends there and says, look, it's up to the countries. If the countries say it's legal, that's it. And this is, I mean, this is the main problem for us. I mean, you cannot trust the Balkan governments to interpret EU directives. I mean, they are not, you know, we can comment on whether it's intentional or not, but they are not fully informed of all the details of, of all the EU like, latest directives. So, yeah, unfortunately, although there is some kind of a, a kind of surface level commitment from Chinese banks to, to make sure that all the... Um, the projects are in line. We don't see it being followed up really with some kind of independent legal due diligence. Uh, when it comes to the EU, I mean, definitely we, we kind of emphasize the, the Chinese because of the, the investments in coal. Um, I think there is still a very active role of the EU and related financing institutions like the EBRD and EIB in the region. Um, and, and also KFW from Germany, um, they are really financing a lot more now wind projects. Um, this, is, this is something which is finally slowly developing. There, there has been a lot of kind of projects hanging around for years, developing really, 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 really slowly. But finally, some of them are actually really in the construction phase now, even a couple have gone into operation. So, so in the wind sector, I think the the EU is really still way ahead with financing. Chinese uh, also told us that they are very neutral. They are willing to to finance also renewables. They also have their renewables companies, many of them, but they are kind of following what the governments are asking for, which in that case means coal. I think the governments are just getting the EU money for, for the projects they can get it for, which is mostly in practice. Now it's mostly either infrastructure like transmission and, and so on, or wind projects. Uh, they could also get a lot of money for energy efficiency projects, but unfortunately this is where we are really stuck in the region. I think um, the donor community is trying quite hard to promote energy efficiency. And I think the, the governments are really not capitalizing it. And I think this is, this is somehow very a result of this very kind of traditional thinking that to be seen as a successful politician, you want to be opening something big, 
new impressive. Uh, and this kind of thinking of small, smart investments is, is really not taken off, which is a shame because this is exactly the kind of investments that are needed in these countries. And, and also the kind of investments that are needed are really ones that would be affordable. So energy efficiency should really be in the first place, but at the moment it's the last place. And I mean, this is something where they, I think the, the, the European donors are trying hard and the companies, uh, the countries are, are not biting at the moment, and we hope that's going to change with continued pressure. Regarding China, I, maybe I just uh, can <laughs> contribute a small anecdote because I happened to just travel to um, to China and to seminars around Chinese investment, and there's really actually a. You know, if you go to China, talk to uh, different institutions, talk to NGOs, talk to think tank, there is an increasing also series of guidelines regarding to financing to our overseas investments, our loans, etc. It's also not you know followed through. So I'm not saying that these you know things are well there. They are not well, <laughs> but you know there's still you know uh, uh, things are in flux there and there is there's movement into the right direction and uh, it, there's a clear signal that china is in some way susceptible to public opinion to press reports etc so in uh, and there are uh, so the more we can also get the word out about these new in, uh, loans and these uh, this new uh, power plants not being in line with EU legislation, I think that will find its way also to higher levels of policy making uh, in China. I, I mean, it's a slightly different case, but um, for example, there is a, a uh, a Chinese company who was operating in Senegal, in this case it was a fishing company that was not compliant with Senegalese law and Greenpeace has been campaigning on it and has documenting the transgression of, of Senegalese law and the Chinese authorities have taken this company out of out of service. They have fined this, the company and have uh, withdrawn the license. So there is a, a certain, you know, that you need to campaign and you need to make this public, you need to put pressure, but there is this commitment to legislation, you can capitalize on it once you make it public. It's not happening naturally. <laughs> it, ne it needs the public press, it needs civil society. And I think that is uh, what, what you are doing. So maybe just further questions uh, from you here in the room. There are two questions over there. So. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, now we've been we've been talking a lot about um, yeah the big power plants and how to supply the the countries, the cities, either coal, gas, and um, of course this is the first question we got to ask. Um, but if I would be asked the question and if I would need to answer it, I would like to know more about, for example, Tusla. We've seen that um, the people are firing um, or getting their heat at home from little coal stoves. And of course, it's very interesting to know more about how is the infrastructure in these countries in the Western Balkan region so far. Um, because in Germany, of course, we're always talking about um, heat from, from distance or things like this. And what do we have over there so far? And because um, then, I, then, I would, um, then it would be easier to answer the question, um, how much gas would we need for the transition, for example? Should we supply these households first with gas so people can have their heat produced with gas or can we directly start with renewables and um, yeah, you, you guys, I guess you got my question. There was a second question over there. Thank you. Christian Hautstein from TU Berlin. Thank you for your interesting uh, talks and presentations. Um, so if we look at the states and we see, let's say, more or less poorly developed economies um, and uh, what, what options can we offer if we say, well, leave the resources you have in the ground and um, you were talking also about market integration, uh, maybe uh, just pay for electricity from uh, elsewhere, um, what can we offer that this there's an incentive to to leave 
um, lignite in the ground and and don't touch their own resources they have, but maybe um, yeah, build up other other sectors of economy um, to also uh, generate wealth. Thank you. Thank you. This, if there's no other question, then I'll um, give this again to the panel. But a quick remark: there's also a resource that they are, is left untapped, which is the, all the sun and the wind. <laughs> it's not just the, the lignite. So there's a lot of resources uh, being not used. Not sure, maybe we just take it the other way around. Pippa, if you would react to these two questions and then we go to, to Dennis and, and to like. Mm -hmm. Sure. So about the, uh, the infrastructure at the moment, it varies extremely by, by country. Uh, some of the larger cities do have district heating, but some, many of them not. Um, and it's often connected to some of them are functional, some of them not, some of them gas, some of them coal. So it's very varied and some of them don't have it at all. Um, uh, my personal opinion is that uh, trying to now gasify, uh, I think it's important to mention that um, Okay, Albania now is, is getting this huge tap pipeline going through it, but for the moment that is not actually part of the Albanian system that's going through Albania. Uh, Montenegro, Kosovo, and some of Macedonia, and I think some of Bosnia as well also is not gasified. I'm not sure of all the details, but there is quite a whole, huge swathe of the region which just is just not supplied internationally by gas pipelines at all. So my personal opinion is like stop there because you don't just need to like bring a bit more gas in one pipe, you know, you need to build pipelines to really get that gas used. You need to build it to you know, every house, company, whatever. So I mean, this is huge, huge investments into a fossil fuel, which ultimately we have to stop using. And it's again, yeah, not, I mean, most of the countries in the region don't produce gas. So, I mean, my, my personal opinion on gas is like, stop right there, we, this is not the solution for the region. Uh, I see much more potential in, in heat pumps and, and for the countryside, I mean, most of the people are using wood. Um, and there's a lot that can be done. I mean, probably that's going to continue, but there's a lot that could be done to, to improve, uh, like using more efficient stoves, having education campaigns to use dry wood instead of wet wood and so on. And there is a lot of use also in the region uh, of electricity, just in kind of old style electric heaters. And I mean, this is hugely wasteful. And if you're going to use electricity, you could at least use it to, to have a heat pump. So, I mean, this, this technology is, is kind of still looking a bit kind of science fiction for the region at the moment. But I think this is something most, most of the, I mean, there are some bigger cities that could, could benefit from central, like central district heating. Uh, but many of the, the, Towns and villages, I mean, are just too small for any kind of central uh, central district heating solutions. So it's it's kind of varying a lot by by country. I mean, Serbia has, and some parts of Bosnia have gas, but a lot of the region just doesn't have it, and uh, and it's really questionable whether it's worth developing it. Um, when it comes to why why would they leave lignite in the ground? I mean, this this also comes back to to the economics of the the electricity supply i mean most of the projects which are being built which are sorry not being built and we are trying to make sure they are not being built they they are being planned still um, they would not be carried out by any normally kind of market oriented company they are not feasible as far as we are aware i mean in most cases we don't have access to the to the full documentation but every time we got hold of a feasibility study or like the contract for the kosovo plant Every time we see some major, major flaws, and even, even that's us who are, I mean, I'm not an economist, 
And I, every time I look through one of those documents, I can see some huge gaping hole where they have failed to include some cost or they've included it inconsistently or obviously wrongly even to me. So, I mean, I cannot imagine what, what someone who is actually really well versed in this area would see. So, I mean, the, the main thing that you can offer is to, you know, not to lose your money on this rubbish, frankly. I mean, this is, this is something which is extremely hard to imagine, I think, in Western Europe, because, you know, there is a perception that everyone's after money, everyone's trying to make money, no matter the environmental standards. But this is exactly the opposite situation. I mean, these are not going to make money. These are going to lose money. And the only reason they're being built is because most of the companies behind them have been planning them already for 20 years at the time when they might have actually brought in some money and they just didn't change their plan since then even though the conditions in the world and in the region have changed immeasurably and they haven't adjusted their plans to match the existing real conditions now they just kind of order some feasibility study that is supposed to come with the right answer and and then they just use it to justify moving ahead and unfortunately there are not that many people who are going to read all those documents and say hang on a minute this is this is rubbish so so the first thing is you know stop throwing away money this is this is the first thing to offer and yeah, the second thing I would really emphasize is energy efficiency. This is the abundant resource which is unused in the region. The one which is, you know, we don't have to have a debate, is it like expensive or is it this or is it that? I mean, it's, it's obviously going to pay off in most cases and, and it's, the, it's probably hard to imagine in a German context, the situation in Kosovo or Albania, where, I mean, technical and commercial losses together are like at least 30% as far as I looked on the last uh, on the last figures. So, I mean, okay, some of them are commercial losses and not technical losses, but I mean, these are huge proportions of the electricity just like being thrown away. So, I mean, yeah, solar, wind, uh, existing hydro is already there that can stay that can help with balancing that can that's a, something which is already in place and can help but really I mean stop throwing away money and stop throwing away electricity I mean these would be the basic things that I would offer which I mean I think is, is hard to emphasize enough but it's really what needs to be done first Dennis, uh, yeah. you, uh, people didn't mention in, in efficiency the question of insulating houses. Are, are houses well insulated in Bosnia? Yeah, well, again, it's very difficult to talk after Pippa. She says everything. So, <laughs> 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 No, but the thing is, yeah, that's, that's where, where we can actually do a lot. Uh, we are throwing away energy, not just electricity. We are throwing away energy. If you drive through the Balkans, you'll see that half of the houses do not have a facade at all, not to mention the insulation. So that's, for me, that's the priority. And it's, it's, it's cost effective, it provides jobs which we need, and, and it brings results. And once you insulate everything, then you figure out how much energy do you actually need to heat the houses. Because you have a tendency of people installing new new boilers or whatever, and then once they insulate the house, they have to invest in another boiler because they were overcapacitated the first one. So that's something we should be prioritized in the whole well in all of the countries of the region, energy efficiency, especially in the building sector. You know, so that's one thing. And the second thing, when when you mentioned about the jobs and and the industry and the thing is that after the war in Bosnia, all other sectors were simply destroyed and no one gave a damn what's happening with the workers. So the only sectors which were sort of kept alive uh, by the authorities were the energy sector and telecommunication sectors because they were 
they were used or misused by the authorities for their own purposes and benefits and employing their friends and, and getting the, the, the profits out of that. And when we talk about the energy sector, uh, uh, as I said, it was kept alive, but it was actually uh, uh, artificially, it is artificially alive because it's, it's functioning based on the heavy subsidies provided by the authorities to the coal mines. Because there you have thousands of workers which are not actually working, they're just employees and they're not really coal miners, they're either administration or whatever, but they're actually uh, uh, a voting machine for the authorities. Uh, and on top of that, you have the situation where Bosnia is actually exporting electricity. And we are subsidizing this export with our health. You've seen the way it's produced. So they're earning money with our health and with subsidizing the coal mine losses through the budget, again with our money. And they claim they had, that they have profits out of this export of electricity. That's not a profit. So uh, you cannot uh, consider the energy sector as a backbone of, of, of the economy of one country. It's there to support the economy. But that's not really something which you can rely on to develop the country. You have to invest in something else, in production of something else. And when we come back to export, I compare export of electricity like export of, of logs. We export logs and then import uh, very expensive furniture. You know, it makes no sense to me. No. Thank you, Dennis. And maybe you, you are already started turning around the question. So the question is not so much whether those countries can afford to leave the lignite in the ground. Maybe the question is otherwise whether they can afford to continue burning it uh, because it's actually a drag on the economy. Uh, so, Dirk, you are... <laughs> your take uh, and you will be also in some way being the last speaker because i'm just looking that time is running fast and so we are I yeah i i like this last question of yours which picks uh, up yours question how how can we convince the countries to leave the the coal in the ground i think this is really the question it's not about telling them don't burn it and that that's too simple <laughs> we have to tell them why and and what else and what instead um, and obviously we have to take um, serious what they fear when they give up burning coal and, and lignite. Uh, one is of course security of supply, stability of, of the system, that's serious. Um, I believe that part of the answer is market integration, part of the answer is market reform. Yes, maybe that means uh, that some of the existing coal fire plants will have to continue as they do now already. Uh, to provide uh, call balancing or baseload uh, energy if, if needed. Um, the other um, threat is the, the loss of, of jobs. That we have to take serious as well, obviously. Um, there, I also strongly believe that energy efficiency, renewables, small-scale renewables, maybe forestry, etc., can be part of the answer. In some countries, obviously, better than in others. In Montenegro, um, there is uh, the, the number of workers uh, is, is relatively limited, so I think for them you can find easy replacement. And anyway, these are not very high qualified uh, jobs as well, but new jobs need to be created. Um, otherwise, it's, it's indeed a no-brainer and it's true that energy efficiency is, is the first and the most important thing, but it's also not as easy as that, because how, how do you incentivize uh, being more energy efficient with the, with the low prices that you have in the region, which of course is a reaction to the poverty of the people. Um, you would have to raise prices to make them save energy. Is that possible? That's another issue I think that we have to address when we want to convince them to keep the lignite in the ground, um, how to make sure. Uh, they all, in, in the region, they all still a bit um, under the impression of what happened in Bulgaria a couple of years ago when renewables subsidies uh, brought a, a true revolution uh, about. People were killed, uh, government fell. 
Um, so we have to take that fear away as well. And there I believe part of the answer is, is auctioning, not just giving artificially high feed-in tariffs. That's also a killer for the budget. Um, and then we have to obviously encourage investment. Uh, and, and there we also, it's, it's complex, it's not easy, it's not just making available money. Uh, the capital markets seem to be at the source of, of the problem, the, the country risk. Um, so this de-risking is very important. Of course, the, the, uh, that relates to all the um, non-reliable institutions, etc. And there, it's also true, I mean, a lot of things need to be done from inside the country. You cannot just uh, come with loads of money and say we fix all that, but if there is no will, and maybe also not the people because they have left the countries um, to, to stabilize and make reliable their institutions, um, then you cannot cover these defaults uh, by loads of, of support or money or incentives. Thank you, Dirk Buschle. Um, I, I was just looking at my clock and we're really uh, kind of already approaching the end of our conversation, I think there is, we have seen there's loads of challenges, loads of opportunities also, I would say, for change. What I think is needed is certainly a, a more attention, I think, from, from Berlin, from the EU to the region, maybe a, also a coherent undertaking and a coherent dialogue. And uh, then I think the opportunities which exist can be harnessed and the risks and the challenges can be overcome. So, thank you very much, Pippa, uh, Dennis, and Dirk, for your wonderful uh, contribution to this very interesting debate. And thank you very much for your attention and for your questions. And have a nice evening. Thank you.